Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Roger McKenzie, Assistant General Secretary of Unison, um, the country's largest trade union, as you know. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled, can tell you how thrilled I am, to be able to um, persuade an old former colleague, of, well, that's not old, because he's not old, but a former, former colleague of mine from way, way old, back. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> never old, never old. But going way back into the 80s, um, when we both worked at... Um, at Tottenham College. Um, and even when um, I met Stella all those years ago, um, Stella had already written um, one of the books that we'll talk about today, I think. I think she'd already written it by then. Um, but the book that um, Stella has been invited along to talk about is this magnificent book, which I'm going to keep plugging all the way through um, this conversation. It's called A Kick in the Belly um, and the uh, Women, Slavery and Resistance. Um, and the author is Stella Dadzi, um, who's one of the former, foremost um, black women feminist um, historians, um, academics, people's historian um, that, that I know from anywhere. It's just such a great, great influence on so many people um, across this country. And I'm delighted that she was able to give us a little bit of time um, to to come on to to our little webinar. Um, hi Stella, how you doing? Lovely to hi. see you. I'm good, thanks. I'm good, thanks, and thank you for inviting me. It's, no, it's uh, ab absolute pleasure of ours, mate. Real pleasure. Um, so, I mean, I, I do want to get on to talk about um, a kick in the belly um, in a bit, but may maybe to start with Stella, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> let me. Um, start off by just giving you my kind of um, work credentials as you say we met at Tottenham Tech prior to that I was a teacher and I think my trade unionism began in the NUT um, when I was union rep and um, continued on through into into working at, at, at the college where we did a lot of work in the margins you'll remember we were in a little unit up the road anybody black female or unemployed was always redirected right. up to, up to <laughs> our unit and we got up, up, up to all kinds of interesting innovative stuff in terms of further education we, we set up the first crush for women in fe we were running black studies courses we were doing all kinds of things that nowadays i think it would be quite difficult to get away with um but i moved on then into into um uh, working at harringay college and soon became very frustrated by by some aspects of, of, of working for the man as I saw it. And I'd also had a year's sabbatical at SOAS where I'd begun to engage with the research that, that ended up with, with the book you, you've referenced and really had this, this kind of naive idea that if I kind of did a bit of training once a week, I could get on with my writing, but it didn't kind of work out like that. So I spent the next few years doing a lot of really interesting work actually with educators right across um, the country and across the world, you know, I worked everywhere, South Africa, um, I worked in Bosnia with women um, who were involved in the war there, um, I worked with the United Nations, but I also worked with kids on the streets of Bermondsey in detached youth projects, so I kind of got um, a feel of the whole, the whole range of, of, of what was going on in education. Um, and a lot running alongside that, of course, was the writing and, and the organising and the activism. Um, oh, yeah, I suppose I should say that um, OAD came out of that in the early 80s as well, early, late, uh, mid 70s, actually, the uh, organisation of Asian and African descent, which was a feminist um, umbrella organisation for black women in this country. Could, could, could you tell us a little bit about that organisation? Um, yeah, I think it was very much a response um, by black women at the time who were tired of the kind of um, male driven um, egocentric kind of politics that were coming out of some of the community organizing at the time and um, also a little bit of frustration with the women's movement which was in its embryonic days at the time but was perceived I think to some extent fairly so as a very sort of white middle class um, uh, set up so it was really um, an attempt to acknowledge all the little community groups, the small community groups that were 
springing up around the country, across London and across across the UK, where black women were coming together in their communities to address the issues that were concerning them, whether it was um, discrimination in education or in the workplace, or whether it was um, issues to do with healthcare, um, police brutality, all, all that whole range of, of issues, which I tend to refer to as the UK civil rights movement, because that's what it yeah. was. You know, we're yeah. always focused on what happened in America, but actually it was going mm. on right under our noses here. And Black Lives Matter is, is nothing new, is it, really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so it was very much a response to that. It was relatively short-lived, but I think like all political organisations, it had a moment, it was of, of its time, and it was when it was needed. And um, I think the, the knock-on effects of OAD are still being felt today, actually because we took those issues back into our careers and into our families and into our communities. I mean, I think one, one of the things that, that I remember from kind of that sort of time was, um, I mean, I, I was really active um, in um, Labour Party black sections and organising black trade unionists um, as well, but also some community um, kind of black worker organising. Nowadays, we have the kind of internet to help us to to kind of do all those things um, mm. that, that we used to do kind of manually, I suppose. I mean, what, I mean, what do, what do you think was the, the kind of biggest challenge in, in putting together um, the, or being part of the group of people that, that put together um, that organisation? Because I mean, it must have been a real challenge to, to try and do that. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't. You know, um, if you think back to the time we're talking about, there was as there still is, you know, a, a plethora of community groups ri arising as a result of, of the context we were living through. And yes, now with hindsight, but hindsight is always 2020, isn't it? And um, we can look and say, yeah, that was hard. We weren't funded. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have um, access to printing or, or um, even, you know, to our networks other than through this kind of fairly informal grapevine. But we did it and we did it. Um, with with determination and and with some results, I think, as I say, that the, oh, the, the results are still being felt. So, yes, it was a challenge. But then, all, all political organisation. I mean, people keep asking me now. <laughs> they say, "What do I think the future of organising is?" And I, I I really don't know how to answer that question because I don't get online activism. I really don't. I don't know whether it's an age thing or whether it's just me. But I kind of like going out on the street with a placard. Me too. Maybe that's a bit off hat. But um, yeah, I, I find it really difficult when people say I'm an online activist. And so what exactly does that mean? You write a blog every day or what? So um, to me, yes, it was it was challenging, but it was real and it was of its time. And um, yeah, it needs to be acknowledged, you know, I, I think so. on, on the shoulders of what went before. I, I think so. And I, th I think... Um... When I, when I look at some of the organising, you know, the kind of grassroots organising, for want of a better phrase, that I see um, taking place now, um, I do see an awful lot of reliance on um, social media. Um, and I see an awful lot of reliance on, you know, whether you've got a computer that can reach everybody or whatever, you've got your internet connection sorted and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm, and I'm not knocking that and I'm not trying to sound like some kind of old fart or something who, who doesn't do all that stuff because I do all of that stuff. But um, I, 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 I often think back and in fact was in a discussion this weekend with uh, um, some former colleagues from some of that work that we were doing as black activists. Um, and still we talked about the importance of um, personal engagement with people and not mm. just talking to people who mm. automatically agree with you because that's not organising. Yeah, absolutely. That's, 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 that's affirmation, isn't it? You know, mm. you're just talking to people who agree with you all the time. Mm. Um, and, that, and that's what, um, for me, was one of the, the kind of important things about that era, that, mm. that we, we, we found a way, as you said, of getting the job done. Um, we didn't have funding because there was also that thing I remember about um, not being reliant on the funding um, of the organisations that actually you're attacking quite often because they needed to be attacked. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you were getting funded from them and attacked them, then simply what was going to happen, they were going to withdraw the funding and then it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's all gone. So so mm -hmm. there was those sorts of things that, that I think 
are important for this conversation, I think, about um, organising, um, which is the, the reliance on the collective, I suppose, is where I'm going with it, um, that, that people working together um, to, you know, with a common kind of goal to get, you know, whatever the, the aim is um, mm. achieved. Um, and that's kind of some of the things that I was seeing in the, and I'm going to keep plugging that, I said I would. Um, you know, that's what I saw in this book was the um, self-reliance, self-organization. Um, but most, most importantly for me, it wasn't just the story of men against enslavement. It wasn't easy. It, it, no. <laughs> No, no, it was, it, no, it's about, you know, you know, there's a whole story there that has not been told properly for all the films that are around, for, for mm. all the, um, for the stories that get told. Um, there's, there's that hidden history, and we'll come on to the hidden history bit in a minute, but you've kind of touched on it already at the beginning about the start of the process. Um, you know, you start when you're at SOAS, which must have been a real thing um, to, to go there. And and and, don't, and I haven't forgotten about Heart of the Race. We, we will touch back um, on that as well. But what led you to to you know go to SOAS and decide this was the the kind of issues that you wanted to research? Um, well, um, I I can't remember the presenting issue, but I think they were actually kind of quite glad to get rid of me for a year, so I got a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were kinds of politics going on at work that uh, that resulted in that and it was a real um, privilege for me and I was a single parent it was a chance to just spend a year immersed in something that I was interested in I'd already as you rightly said written um, co-authored The Heart of the Race so I was particularly interested in just searching for those invisible women and um, I majored, my, my major in, uh, uh, on the course I was doing was slavery and labour oppression in the new world. So um, it, it started, the, the, the research started with just looking at what happened to women on the plantations in the British West Indies and trying to tease out the story, um, as you say, that, that had been basically airbrushed out of history, you know. Um, and yes, I have to acknowledge that there were historians, um, many of them based in the Caribbean, though not exclusively, who were already beginning to engage with the primary sources to, to look at um, some, some aspects of that experience. And yeah, that, that became the starting point, really, beginning to, to um, just just the desire to not only tell that story but to tell it to a wider audience because one of the frustrations I've always had is that these debates go on at a very academic level and mm. very much um, you know um, to, to, to a club of people who are aware of each other and who are having lively and interesting discussions but it doesn't actually touch ordinary people's lives because they don't get to hear about it so um, I, I just saw my role in terms of that book as just making that those debates more accessible and um, yeah, just making sure that story was was on record. Did you, did you see um, your latest book as building on Heart of the Race? Um, I don't think I did consciously, but I think it, it, it does clearly. And, and the Heart of I the felt. Race actually does, does touch on some of that history in a far more um, uh, shortened way, you know, obviously it, it starts with history and moves forward. But um, I don't think it was a kind of conscious conscious endeavour to, to, to build on it, but um, that's my area of interest as a historian, so I guess it's, it, it's fairly inevitable. Yeah, yeah. So why A Kick in the Belly? Where did that title come from? Um, it's a great title, isn't it? I, I, yeah, um, I love it. I... Um, did a lot of reading of um, some of those primary sources, um, people like Monk Lewis, who um, was a planter, uh, an absentee landlord, who went over to Jamaica a couple of times in the early 19th century, and he kept a very detailed diary. And one of the observations he made was that he had plantations on both ends of the island of Jamaica, 
and he had visited both and seen examples of black women being literally physically kicked in the belly. One lost a child as a result, the other one was, was crippled as a result. So, so the quote he, he, in his diary is worse to the effect that I, I feel I'm entitled to say that black women are kicked in the belly from one end of this island to the other. And it, it really served to me as a, as a really powerful metaphor, not only for what women experienced under enslavement, but also how they responded to it because they kicked back, you know, and they kicked back at the belly of, of the slavery project, if you think. Yeah. Transatlantic slavery was abolished, the, the actual the shipping of slaves across the Atlantic the whole project of slavery rested on black women's wombs. Yeah. Without women giving birth, there were no next generation of slaves. So, you know, that whole um, power that black women were able to exercise, unbeknown necessarily to them or to, to uh, unacknowledged by others, is, is a story that's been understated. I, I, I found that a really powerful um uh, statement um, a kick in the belly um, my um, my family's from Jamaica and my mum and my dad uh, were born in Jamaica um, and I'm trying to trace um, our family history um, mm. and um, so reading that in the book um, I just I, it, it kind of gave me a kick actually because it said it this this could be your family yeah literally mm. um, and um, and that's and um, not for the first time, um, because, you know, I mean, I, I read a lot about um, our history um, mm. when you can find it, which is another thing we'll come on to um, about finding this history. Um, but um, it was um, took it very personal, actually, uh, when I was reading the book. Um, mm. and, I, and, I, and I just felt, um, actually, this is something that's still happening to us. Um, in a sense, I, I, I kind of equated it to um, the kind of George Floyd um, knee on the the neck kind of thing. Um, yeah. so it was one of the first things that came to my mind when I, when I was reading mm. that. We are mm. still being um, held down, oppressed, kicked in the mm. belly, kicked mm. in the head, um, mm. still being um, held to different standards, still being um, oppressed in so many different ways. But the way that often isn't talked about enough, which is why I was so keen to, to get you on the webinar, was about women and mm. the contribution that um, women of African descent made um, to getting rid of slavery, because for me, it's not talked about enough that. Mm. And I was reading something about um, food recently and about how, um, um, we, uh, actually, it's in the book, I believe, that um, women of um, African descent kept seeds in their hair mm. um, and transported um, and, and carried them across the Atlantic um, mm. with them. And, and if that's not an act of resistance, I don't mm. know what is. I really mm. don't know what that is. <laughs> for me, that um, is such a powerful thing to do. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I think in the book it talks about what they carried with them in their heads because yeah. you know, the, the, the most powerful and iconic image of, of the enslaved woman is as someone who came naked on a yeah. ship across the Atlantic. But what people don't often acknowledge is that she actually came with a whole set of cultural references she would probably, unless she was very young, have gone through some form of initiation process that would have um, socialised her, given her a sense of self, of, of her role as a woman. And as you say, she would have brought with her knowledge of plants, herbs, her natural environment, the medicinal qualities, all of those things that became the means of survival for generations of enslaved people. I mean, it was passed on, and even to this day, we can see you know, uh, the legacies um, that exist. If, if you're from Jamaica, then you know that um, the language um, hmm. uh, is, is still very resonant of, of the language of, of, of people who came from different parts of Africa, but particularly Fantia Khan, which is my hmm. um, father's roots. He's, he's from Ghana. So, you know, that, that fascinates me, that whole sense of, of, of what survived despite every effort to repress it 
And I think that's the starting point. When I was writing the book, one of the things that concerned me was that it wasn't a story of victimhood. Mm. You know, you've got so many people who object to even talking about slavery because they, they don't like the sense that, you know, people either were enslaved or were enslavers. It's a difficult conversation that they'd rather sidestep. And, you know, when you get a situation where black kids in school are objecting to being taught about it because they feel shamed by it or they just don't want to know, then I think something's gone wrong. I think something's gone wrong because those kids should be proud of that history. They should yeah, be proud I... of their resilience and their courage and their staying power and their ancestry. Yeah, I get that entirely. But I also remember um, being taught in inverted commas, um, about um, the transatlantic slave trade when I was at school. So this was during the 70s, I guess, when mm -hmm. I was being taught this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the abuse that we used to get from, um, there was always fighting that would take place, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. whenever we talked about transatlantic slave trade, because it was never being taught properly. And mm -hmm. we were, um, we were, um, portrayed as victims yeah and i think a lot of that, that um, came out of roots didn't it yeah you roots. know you my generation so you remember that everybody the biggest form of abuse in the in the playground was to be called kin, kin kinse. Kinse. absolutely you know? but that was in a context i felt where the schools were just like they were you know just play giving a sop to, to to the teaching they weren't putting it in context they were you know white history black history month white history year that's what i always say you know that yeah. you had this splurge of interest that um quickly dissipated and then you were back to the real history now i feel a bit of a his hypocrite because i'm sitting here with a with a post blind that says before there's an interview of black history. But, um, that aside, you know, I, I, I think we were talking earlier, you know, I think um, there's a sense in which Black History Month has passed its sell by. You know, we, we need to have this stuff mainstream. It shouldn't just be history. It should be right across the curriculum because yeah. while we just kind of do this, then people are going to get um, snippets of history. They're not going to see it in context. They're not going to have a chance to kind of um, see the whole picture. No, I, 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 I agree um, with that. I mean, I, I mean, I, I kind of um, keep wondering um, about um, you know, this whole thing of the Black History Month and White History Year, as you, as you, as you say, and 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 I, I keep thinking, especially lately, that it's time that we shifted the conversation a little bit um, because we, over the last year in particular, there's been this stuff about Black Lives Matters and all of that stuff and of course of course we matter right um but the fact that we have to tell people that we matter i find you know and i support the movement of course i do but i find it a little bit kind of partial and minimalist to to actually just try and convince somebody that my life matters as a black person how did we ever get to this position from um we want black power for example you know it's a big big shift and i i think i think there's some issues that we have to look at where there's so many people who are very, very comfortable with the notions of you know, coming out and saying things like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, we have to turn this moment into a movement. And it's very, very comfortable. And I think we have to make it, I think we have to shift things on a little bit. Um, and I get, I get that from um, our kind of shared history of resistance basically. So I resist when I think that people um, are, are not taking this, these things seriously. What you talked about in the book was a history of resistance to people who were, I mean, we think people are trying to kill us now, but they were really trying to um, destroy our hearts and souls and bodies. They ripped us apart from our families. And it's those stories of resistance, really, that I kind of, I suppose I'd like to touch on next because the the story is often that, well, we kind of got grabbed in a village or whatever, or by a river um, and then got transported off and just took our lot basically. And that occasionally, but only occasionally, 
there was the odd act of resistance to this stuff by some superhuman beings or whatever. And yet the story that you portray quite brilliantly in this book is the constant resistance that took place the constant acts of resistance and how women black women african women were absolutely at the forefront of that can you give us some examples of some of the things that happened that you point out that you point out in the book yeah well i i did want to um ground what happened in the plantations into its wider context and we've already touched on that. You know, those people didn't come empty headed. They came not just with knowledge and, 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 and culture, but they also came with their own socialization. And when you look at pre-colonial African women, whether you, Queen and Zinga, um, uh, Beatrice um, Vita Kimper, um, and later on people like Yaa Sintewa, um, and they're just the few stories that have survived you know, bearing in mind that we come from oral cultures and the few times we've written things down, they've quite often been destroyed or, or uh, appropriated. A few surviving stories suggest that right across the African continent, and of course we're talking about a very culturally and geographically diverse place, which we call Africa, but right mm. across that continent, you see evidence of women um, rising to become powerful beings, rising military leaders, tactical leaders, spiritual leaders, and having very specific roles. And I'm not romanticizing that. I'm not trying to say that it was one great um, Garden of Eden. No, no way. You know, you're still talking about in many societies, anyway, a very patriarchal context. But women had a specific role and they were enabled to, to carry out the kinds of things. So when, when we talk about what women brought with them across the Atlantic, we're also talking about that sense of agency. Um, and you see it everywhere. You see it in the small acts of day-to-day -day resistance that the slave owners would, would um, refer to as malingering, people being lazy, right? But which any trade unionist would understand is actually called a mm. go slow. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? um, to right through to people poisoning the whole family if they were a cook. Um, or people literally taking up weapons and 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 getting involved in in slave rebellions. So um, you've got all of that. But then, of course, if you just focus on the women um, in this story, then you've also got that really powerful um, role that they had, determining how many new enslaved people would be born to continue to slave for massa. And what you see in the West Indies is this steady decline. And it's interesting because if you're a historian and you compare that data with the demo demographics in the United States where you had much smaller slave holdings, you had a different setup altogether, you don't see that. So there's a very specific and distinct demographic decline, which even the, the West India lobby and the, the, the parliamentarians and all those who were vested in in, in slavery began to sh you know scratch their heads and say what's going on here we've tried we've offered these women incentives we've we've built laying in hospitals so we can control them we're giving them better food we're giving them time off work in the fields we're giving them monetary incentives cows hogs all kinds of things they were throwing at these women and yet the birth rate, uh, birth rate de declines. Now, there's some historians who say, well, that, that was due to the objective material conditions. But actually, no, because if you look at other women who had the same objective material conditions, they were still able to increase the birth rate. So you've got something going on here. And then when you look at the parliamentary debates, you start to hear parliamentarians talking about these black women taking abortants because they cannot be bothered to breed. Yeah. Or you hear stories of infanticide, which is a very uncomfortable discussion. But actually, in the context of slavery, that in itself was an act of resistance. And you, you've got a woman, I think, who's referred to in the book. I think her name was Sabrina Park, who, who came down the, 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 the steps of the courthouse and was seen to laugh. But her, her crime was murdering her child. And she said, I will not bring a child into this world to, 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 to slave for massa. She was clear. And I'm not saying all those women had that conscious, you know, sense of resistance, but you're talking about a culture of resistance that was yeah. there in the smallest acts from choosing to wear your hair a certain way, 
choosing to dance and to play certain instruments even drumming could be punished by the, you know torture and death in some plantations so you're talking about an amazing act of resistance and survival that needs to be acknowledged and to me if i think about you, you mentioned earlier it's, it's it's resonance with what's happening today i find that a real story of hope you know, like most people, I suspect, who are listening to this this uh, discussion, we're living through some pretty, pretty times, you know, some very, very challenging times. And I have no idea how it's going to pan out, not just the pandemic, but climate change and just just war and the rise of the right and so many different things that we can talk about. So the fact that I can look at my ancestors and say, look what they went through, look what they survived. I am here to tell that tale because of them. That to me, as I say, is an act, is, is a real expression of hope. Absolutely, I think that's so well put because um, I, was, I was thinking well, while, while you were talking about um, um, equating those kind of acts of resistance, which are often kind of portrayed as quite small acts of resistance, but also bigger ones. I mean, it doesn't get much bigger than infanticide, I suppose. Um, but um, I was thinking of something that the African American historian um, Robin Kelly um, was talk talks about a lot in his work um, about, um, particularly in the South of the United States, where those small acts of resistance were taking place. Um, it, you know, people didn't need a committee meeting to do things, right? Um, they had conversations with each other um, about, um, we are not going to put up with this anymore, knowing that that in itself was a massive act of resistance, punishable by death quite often. Um, but, but they were taking those decisions and doing that organizing. And then my mind went on to um, a story that I often tell about um, wh where I'm from in the black country in the, in the West Mids. There was a story of um, uh, some black workers in a foundry in the West Midlands. Um, and they, they did these small acts of resistance there. That comes from somewhere. It doesn't just happen. People have a memory of what mm. happened before and what their foreparents mm. did. Um, mm. but, but also, again, they didn't need a committee meeting to sort things mm. out. And, and this is weird coming from a trade unionist who lives in committees, I suppose. Mm. But um, what they did, I remember, in that foundry was that they um, would just say, go around the, um, the factory and say, we're meeting at the at the break. We're meeting in the toilets, um, and and they would have a discussion about what was happening, um, and then say, right, you go and talk to somebody else. You go and talk to somebody else. You go and talk to somebody else. Come back tomorrow and tell us that you've done it, and we'll work out what we're going to do. For that. Basic, rawest form of organising. And when when you were talking, I was thinking all of that stuff must come from somewhere. You know, people. Um, must have those conversations but then i start to think you've, you've actually got as well all of these different languages these different heritages that are around and so that's an added difficulty but people still found a way of resisting um mm. not just on the island of mm. jamaica mm. or wherever or in the states but but actually even before they got onto the that's onto right the and it's, yeah absolutely and i think um you know, there's stories of resistance on the Coffle line, there's stories of resistance in the Barracoon. We have um, ample stories of resistance on board ship. I think the, the figure is something close to 500, I think 485 on board rebellions that are recorded. And of course, we're only looking at, I think it's British, Dutch and, 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 and Spanish. I can't remember which three countries where the data is available from, but you know, that doesn't show the whole gamut at all. And um, what that amounts to is that despite the shackles, despite the torture, despite the you know horrendous conditions that people put up with during the Middle Passage, something like one in 10 ships experienced some form of insurrection. And quite often because there was this perception that women were less of a threat, they stick the men in shackles straight away and bundle them down down into the hold, but the women were often left to wander. 
not always, but quite often. Um, and that was partly self-interest because, of course, they were freely available to the sailors who wanted to be able to grab them and rape them, which was also um, an experience that, that uh, is under-documented. But what it meant was that those women became the eyes and ears of the ship or the eyes and ears of the captives on the ship. They could see when the watch changed. They could see where the weaponry was stored. They could see how many people were available to, to put up any resistance. And they quite often smuggled a hammer or whatever implement was used to break that chain that meant people could unshackle themselves and come up um, you know, above board and, and, and uh, take on uh, their captors. And there are some really remarkable stories of people who succeeded. They actually succeeded in taking the boat. Quite often those insurrections took place within sight of land. So people were able to either get one of the sailors or uh, use their own skills to get back to the coast if they were within sight of Africa. Quite often there were guerrilla um, attacks mounted from the land on those ships. Um, and then you see examples of um, not just insurrections during during the course of the, the, um, the Middle Passage, but actually when they came within sight of land on the other end of the journey. Again, you see examples of people trying to take over the ships. And when you think how debilitated people were and the fact how debilitated you would be if you'd lay, lain for three months in your own uh, physical waste without anything more than a couple of, uh, uh, of minutes exercise, if you were lucky, um, then you just realize what an amazing feat that was. And there I mean, is I actually, suppose... um, I was oh, just going to say, there, um, there's a whole province, I think it's called Esmeraldas in, in Ecuador, which is people oh, yeah, by, yeah, yeah. By, yeah. by, you know, people who managed to mutiny and, and, and make it, make it to land. So, yeah, I saw, you know, I, I saw a program on it um, recently it was, um, it was, this, um, oh, it was it Samuel L. Jackson was oh, yeah. um, the actor and he, he was, um, yeah, he yeah, was yeah. kind of leading this thing and it was yeah. a, a program mm. with people who, um, a d diving to find um, the wrecks of, of um, the ships. Yeah, it's amazing. It ships. Interesting, Fantastic yeah. program. Yeah, and he Fantastic. did nice um, interviews with some maroons, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Who, who, yeah, but who, I, think he went, I think he went to that place. It was fantastic. I suppose when you put it like that, though, Stella, I mean, it's no wonder they never taught us that stuff at school. <laughs> no. <laughs> because, you know, they, <laughs> You know, these people, these people fight back, you know, I mean, that's not, that's, that yeah, well, we do anyway, we do anyway, we, 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 do, we do anyway, we do anyway, and it's a mindset, isn't it, when you say, you know, what yeah. is it, I think it's a mindset, it's a mindset of resistance, it's a mindset of, you're not going to do this to me, I know my own worth, yeah, you know, absolutely. and that comes, comes out time and time again, but actually yeah. it would be much more helpful if people were able to resist in a context where they had some self-knowledge, some self-belief, some self-esteem, and some sense of history, because otherwise we fight blind. We, we fight without any sense of, um, perhaps that's the wrong term, but, you know, without any sense of what exactly we're fighting for. Now, I see a lot of debates going on in, in the context of feminism around, you know, do we want this liberal feminism where we just get a few more women on the boardroom and a few more women in positions of power, a bit more visibility, and then all the problems go away? Or do we want a radical vision of feminism that is about social transformation, which is about abolitionism, which is about looking at, you know, a society that doesn't need to incarcerate tens of thousands of people every year, a society that doesn't need to herd children into a classroom to generate learning. Those kind of radical um, visions of an alternative way of living um, that that require not just women, but people across the board to 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 try and, and and think outside the box, and I think that discussion needs to happen in the context of 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 uh, race equality and and and, and yeah. anti racism because at the moment we're still stuck in this kind of place where a lot of people think that it's just about getting a few more black faces yeah, in the House of Commons or because we've got Meghan Merkel Markle and um, Diane Abbott and and Oprah Winfrey that somehow we've made it yet for the vast majority of black women, black men and women, nothing has changed. And, you know, you were talking about Black, black Lives Matter. I did want to say, Roger, that one of my frustrations with that movement is I, I believe that Black Lives Matter wherever they are and that we shouldn't just with the way the police behave towards us in 
the UK or indeed in the US of A, we should obsess about the fact that, you know, children are dying every time I click my finger from preventable diseases because of the unequal way wealth is distributed in the world and the, the, the greed of our own societies for the resources that should be more equally shared. All of those things are also about Black Lives Mattering. And yeah, we need to really have a more global perspective on these these issues if we're actually going to engage with them. Because to me, it's too much navel gazing going on at the moment. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And one of the things that, um, or one of the reasons why I think your work is so important, and and I hope um, you, you're already planning the next book um, that you're going to do, because we, we need more people who are writing history in an accessible way. Um, you know, too much history is written in a way that is um, people um, who are um, already historians writing for other historians, which is great for historians, but there's a lot of us who need to know where we've come from so that we can plan where we're going to next. Um, and that's why I think your work is so important. And I, I put it on a level um, with, um, you know, the likes of um, you know Howard Zinn in the States and the sort of stuff that he wrote um, about in terms of the United States was, um, was about people's history. And a lot of that was oral. Um, mm. and, um, but it was accessible. It, it wasn't written like, um, you know, you got, you know, some kind of, um, problem with using small words or with using words that people <laughs> actually understand and haven't got to wander mm. off to a dictionary to mm. find out every line about. Mm. Um, and for me, that's, that's the great thing about what you do is that we need, we need to have that, the tools at our disposal, really really accessible tools at our disposal that people who are not historians can pick this stuff up and and use so um you know i mean i, I, I just think it's it's fantastic stuff um that you're doing and we need to teach more historians we need to teach more of our people actually um to tell these stories about what has happened to us and about how we can use that um that knowledge to help us to continue to move forward so that we can deal with, as, as you said, have that global view. Because it's always mm -hmm. seemed to me that as black people, um, our default position should be a global view, really, because we're global, you know? I mean, we were shifted <laughs> across the world. You know? <laughs> so, so why shouldn't our position be global? And, and when you look at climate change, you mentioned earlier on, um, well, it's the global South that is gonna take the brunt is already taking the blunt brunt of um, climate change and it will continue to do so and we have to use the information that we've got to help us to build resistance to build organization that's going to bring about for me that fundamental change um, that's needed um, so I, I, I just think we, we, we need you to sit down and write some more really <laughs> great stuff great stuff I mean, I mean, we're moving towards um, the, the kind of end of the time that we've got. Um, one, one of the things that um, I always ask people who come on um, these webinars to do is to um, recommend um, a book that they read or are reading. Um, well, before you get in, I'm going to say to everybody, this book is something, look at it on the screen. This book is something that you all need to get um and is is a remarkable um book of organizing um because um organizing should often i believe be seen as resistance but organized resistance um in its smallest senses but also in a larger sense as well and you'll see both of those things small acts of resistance and larger acts of resistance um talked about in this um in this book um, and for me, the challenging issue for all of us is to think of um, organizing and the resistance to enslavement as not just being the province of men. It absolutely wasn't. It's uh, um, women played an absolutely pivotal role in all this. And all of that is talked about um, in this book. So for me, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So are you asking me for a recommendation? Yeah, um, it's a really difficult one, but I think 
I think I'm inclined to go with a piece of fiction um, because it seems to me that it really complements a kick in the belly. Um, you know, non-fiction can give you a kind of overview of what went on or historical insights, but novels tend to get under the skin, don't they? So my recommendation would be uh, Book of the Night Women by Marlon James. Oh, I've read it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which is a, a really superb piece of writing. And I think it kind of illustrates something that I was talking about in, a, in another podcast I did recently, where I was asked what my definition of allyship was. And I thought, hmm, okay, um, allyship, surely that means that, you know, we can all support each other in anything. You know, um, it's not my prerogative as a black woman to only address those issues that affect me as a black woman. Um, and I just thought, you know, um, when people ask me questions like, you know, should men write history? or should white people write about black history? I, get, I just find those conversations so redundant because of course they should, of course they should. And that book that I've just mentioned is a perfect example of a man, a Jamaican man being able to literally put himself into the body, into the mindset, into the shoes of a black woman experiencing enslavement and to write about it from that perspective. It's just, I, I think, a piece of phenomenal writing. Yeah, it's a phenom phenomenal yeah. author, generally, I think. Yeah, it's really, a, um, really great stuff. Okay, um, well, can I um, genuinely, um, it's great to see you again after all these years, really great. And, 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 and can I um, thank you so much um, for giving us your um, valuable time to, to come on and chat with me basically um, about um, a book that I think is going to um, go down as um, as, a, as a really important piece of work um, because it, it's leading us all, I think, on a, on a journey to look more deeply um, into issues about how enslavement was actually defeated and who was responsible for that and challenging some of the narratives around that as well. Um, and, and, and really challenging ourselves to look more deeply into some of these issues as well, which is probably for lots of us, me included, probably um, that one of the hardest things to do, challenge all the assumptions um, mm. that, that we've made and some of the things that we've read um, over the years. Um, Please let us know um, what your your next plans are for, for the next book, so I can get ready. I'm working on a novel, but I'm not a Marlon James, so it might take a while. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sure. I'm sure it'd be great. I'm sure it'd be great. And Stella, um, really take good care of yourself, um, and stay safe and well. You and, too. Um, you know, um, thanks for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thanks everybody who was listening.